know what it is about the, being in the four walls. I know that's nothing special, but at home I can listen to worship songs. I can spend time in my Bible. But when I'm at church, something about being around you all, it just focuses my spirit and my mind and oh, I get to be at church and just shut out the noise for a while and worship God and learn something new and be inspired. And I'm telling you, I usually get here in seven in the morning on Sundays and I leave about one. And when I leave, I'm on like a high. I'm so excited because I've gotten to worship. I've probably listened to Nate tell me something that makes me think he was sitting at my dining room table all week long. And I've seen people work inside their gifts and I am just, I'm full of energy on a Sunday. And hear me, that's the why. Why would I not want to then tell somebody else? You got to come because, man, when I'm done on Sunday, I walk out feeling refreshed and new again and restored. And that's the why. When you see these balls inside of display back in that hallway, don't, why in the world are we doing that? That's the why. So we don't keep that feeling to ourselves, so that we let other people experience that same thing. And that's the why we might share our story with someone. Because when I have something from the Bible just leap out of the pages on a Wednesday when I'm deep in the throes of a crisis, that should compel me to want to tell someone about it so they can experience the same thing when they're in the middle of a crisis. So when you walk out into the hallway, if you're new here, you might be thinking, what is she talking about? <laughs> when we invite someone to come experience our family here at First Alliance, we ask you to write their name on a blue ping pong ball and put it back there. And if you share the gospel with someone and they come to join our big church family, they believe in Jesus Christ, we put their name on it and put it back there. Maybe today as you walk out, just take a moment to look and imagine, imagine what names you'd like to see there, what loved one you'd like to share that experience with, or you'd like them to have that same assurance that you have. Imagine and pray for them this week. Something else you get to do with us, whether you're here in person or online, is we get to celebrate the Lord's Communion today. So if you're sitting right in front of me and you kind of forgot to pick one of these up, that's okay. Just scooch back during that first song and grab one of these. If you're at home joining us, welcome, share. You get to invite someone as a friend right now. You could just share the live stream. And you might want to prepare your communion elements so that you can join us in that celebration later. But for right now, would you guys stand and join me as we worship God together?
have a seat for just a moment. Hey, if you're new today or you're visiting, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Tracy, and I direct the kids' ministries here at First Alliance. And if you are new, I just wanted to mention, if you are looking for a church home and you want to get connected, we have a really easy way for you to do it. You just take out your phone, and you text the words NEW, N-E-W, the number two, and then the letters F-A-C. You text that to 94,000, and we'll send you some information about our church. Being in kids' ministry, one of the things we talk about to help the kids understand what the Bible really is, we say it's more than a collection of true stories, okay? The Bible is God's one big story. It's one big comprehensive story of the one true God and how he wants a relationship with you. But something Pastor Nate was saying um, in his sermons the last couple weeks, we're looking at, this, at Psalm 23, and he was saying, you know, David penned these words, and it got me to thinking, we, we look at typeface, but really, when this was written, it was penned. It was quilled, probably. <laughs> the effort that that must have gone through, it's really God's letter to us, God's love letter to us. And I don't know about you guys, but when I get something handwritten, it just means a little bit more. Like over in my office, I've gotten texts and emails from people that have you know, just helped encourage me during the day, but I have two cards from the last couple months I just keep on top of my desk because someone took the time. It's not just about the message, then it's about the person who wrote the message. That they took the time to think about me, think about something I needed to hear and sent it to me. And we recognize that same thing goes for kids. So in 2020, when everything shut down, uh, Jamie and I, we were looking for ways to connect with our families. How do we let them know that we're still thinking about them, that we still love them, that we want to see them again, that they should be opening their Bible. So one of the things we did is we went on a website called Canva, and we taught ourselves how to make our own postcards and ordered them, and we sent them out all over the county, and we still do that. Our team, there's a whole board full of postcards that teachers and assistants can just pick from and write a little note to one of their kids, and we throw a stamp on it, and we send it off, and that may not sound like a lot, But when you think about how much it means when you get a handwritten card or postcard, we've had four-year-olds walk into the check-in room holding their postcard. You know, I had a grandma tell me, oh, they're all on her mirror, and they have to stay there. If I move them, I'm in trouble. Just two weeks ago, a little boy's mom said, oh, he has a special place on his wall where he puts all the postcards. It's not something little, you guys. It's a message, and the message we write on there is important, but it's also the message that someone who wrote it loves you and is thinking about you. And the only reason I have that money in my budget to do something like that is because you guys give every week faithfully. Your tithes, your offerings help us to do all kinds of things. And maybe that's one little thing you didn't even know that we did. That means so much to the kids who walk through our doors. So thank you. Thank you for helping us do something that seems so small but can mean so much. After all, when we get a written message to us, it tells us so much, not just the message, but who sent it. Thank you. If you are new here today and you're wondering how do you do that or you're looking to make your gifts um, more regular, then you can do it by putting your gift inside the envelope in the chair in front of you. And there's two receptacles in the back hallway. If that's how you like to give, by hand writing that check. Or if it's more handy for you, like my family, we just set it up all online. You can text, you can go to the website. There's so many ways, but just thank you. Thank you for remembering why you give. Sometimes it's just so that a teacher can send a four-year-old a postcard and it might mean the world to them. Would you guys join me as we pray over our gifts today? God, thank you for this love letter you sent to us and for what it means that you loved us so much that you worked through the Holy Spirit to write these words through prophets and kings and disciples and apostles so that we would have the message thousands of years later. God, thank you for each person here who continues to give so that your message can go forth, whether it's to five and six-year-olds who walk through our doors or to someone who lives all the way across the world. I just thank you. God, I thank you for using our gifts in your plan, in your perfect plan to reach others for your name. I pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you guys stand with me? We're going to sing another worship song together. Oh my 
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, for your faithfulness to us. Lord, let us never be so quick to run off from celebrating, rejoicing, and simply thinking upon how good you've been to us. Let that constantly be at the forefront of our minds, Father. We love you. Praise you. Amen. Take a seat for just a moment. Hopefully you had the chance as you came in to pick up one of those cups, the juice and the cracker. If you're there at home joining with us, welcome you. I want to invite you to do the same. If you haven't already, grab a little something to participate in this time. And you don't have to be a member of First Alliance Church to do this. This is just about whether or not you are a follower of Jesus Christ. So we invite you. We invite you, whatever your background, wherever you've been, whether you're here for a day or you've been here for 20 years, if you are a follower of Jesus, to take part in this time with us. We refer to it as communion. And the word alone speaks to exactly what it is. It's a chance to stand in unity, communion and fellowship with one another, united around one common sacrifice that was altogether uncommon at the same time. It's a chance for us to come and fix our eyes on Jesus. And, and this moment, as we do this, it's not just about celebrating or remembering or reflecting on what Jesus did. It's about remembering, celebrating, and reflecting on who he is. You see, as he sat there with his disciples, if you don't know the story, aren't really familiar with it, Jesus sat with his disciples just a short time before he was to be crucified. And he shared in a meal with them, one that they knew, but he changed the game that night. He changed the meaning of that meal that they had together. And he said, from now on, every time that you eat this bread, every time that you drink from this cup, I want you to remember me. I want you to remember, yes, what I'm about to do, but I want you to remember who I am. And the fact that I continue to be at work in your life, the fact that I continue to do wonders and miracles and, and change you and transform you to become more like what you were created to be. And so as we take this communion, I was reminded this week of the words of the author of Hebrews who said this, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Just before this, the author of this book has talked about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah. And he goes on to talk about Rahab and their stories and how they just trusted God to be at work in their lives. He says, therefore, since we have that huge crowd, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Did anybody feel slowed down this week? Have some stuff that came a, bit, a, a distraction to you? Maybe caused you to doubt or wander or wonder what God was doing? Throw it off. Strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And how do we do that? Do this by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's writing the story. Let's keep our eyes focused on him. That's what this moment is about. Yes, what he did. But because of what he did, we can now experience what he's doing in our lives. So take this bread, do it in remembrance of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Take and eat. In the 
juice, that symbol of his perfect, spotless, sinless blood. That because it was spilled, it covers us. Meaning that all of our sin, all of our indiscretions, all of those times that we fall short, his blood makes a way for us. Take and drink. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you that this morning we can come into this place and we can thank you with loud voices, with hands raised for the work that you did on that cross, but that we can celebrate that because of what has been done, you continue to do. You continue to do a work in our lives. You continue to do works through our lives. And this morning, we simply celebrate that what you've done who you are and we pray it in your name amen amen will you stand with us once more and sing This world could never satisfy the longing in my soul When all is lost and hope is dry When all I feel is cold I'm coming back to your presence I'm coming back to your presence
that we can worship you, Lord, that we can lift you up, but that we can also at the same time admit what our need is for you, Lord, that we can just bring all those things to you that are maybe broken or shattered or whatever, Lord, and that you will put those pieces back together again, Father. I just ask for the remainder of this service, Lord, that you will open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear the word that Nate will speak with us today, Father, and just give us something specifically that we can get from this message today, Lord, that's directly for us. In Jesus' name, amen. shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. So we continue this week our series, our walk through Psalm 23. These words, as we heard earlier, penned by David, not just, again, I think it's worth us bringing this back up each week. Not just a song that he wrote as he sat on some uh, hillside looking out over a meadow and just thought, oh, that's beautiful. Let me write a little song about, you know, God, my shepherd. These, again, are words that were squeezed out of the life of a man who had been through so much. Good, bad, ups, downs, everything that you can imagine. This was a man, David, who himself was a shepherd, uh, who served as a military leader, who was chased off by his own king uh, into hiding, into exile for years, who eventually came back to become king and as king made some really beautiful, wonderful decisions as a leader himself led by God, yes, but also as a leader who made some really stupid decisions, not at all led by God. Anybody ever been in that category before? Two of us, cool, that's great. Uh, no, but th this was David, this is who he was, this is what he went through. Next week we're even going to see uh, perhaps how meaningful these words were as we look at the, the time, the place in which David possibly wrote these words. It, it gives it even more weight. So that's what we've been talking about. Those are the words that come from the heart and the life of David as he writes Psalm 23. So to kick it off, just as we did last week by quoting the first verse, let's continue this week and see who did their homework. <laughs> okay, Psalm 23, 1 and 2. Let's just quote this together. Psalm 23, 1 and 2. I'll get you started and then you keep it going. Okay, here we go. Psalm 23, starting verse 1, 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd. I... How? 
Hey, that wasn't too shy. I'm going to tell you what, you get, Dwayne, we need to pass out some points. They get a gold star. That was the best service today. Good job, guys. Give yourself a hand. That wasn't the best service. <laughs> I'm messing with you. So last week we saw this shepherd who makes us lie down in green pastures, leads us beside still waters, that he sustains us and settles us, a place of provision and a place of rest, both of those. And he continues, and that's where we're going to go this week, this third line from David's psalm. Let's look at it together. He writes, he restores my soul. Some of you have that in verse two, depending on your translation. This one we're walking through, it's in verse three. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. So let's do it. Let's say it together. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. So good. So David continues to offer this imagery for us of God as shepherd. And in doing so, the first thing that he points out to us today is he says this, my shepherd leaves me with a restored heart. This, this should be beyond encouraging to us. This should cause something within us to just cry out, thank you, God, to hear these words that my shepherd leaves me with a restored heart. We don't have to go far. We don't have to dig deep. It's right there in the text. It says, he restores my soul. And it's so cool and beautiful because here what David is doing is, as we saw last week, he continues to build one image on top of the next. Each thing gives us a greater understanding for what's to come. And each line gives us a greater understanding of what we just read. So he's, he's painting this beautiful image of our shepherd adding one bro, bro, brush stroke at a time, just giving us this fuller understanding of our shepherd. And he says that he restores my soul. And this word that he uses restored in the Hebrew, it's this, it's shub. And it means this. I want everybody to take your hands, stick them out like this. If you're at home, you do it too. I can see them, but it, you're on the honor system, so you better do it. Now, stick your hands out like this, okay? Full participation. And, and this word restores means this. It means bring back. Everybody do that. Ready? Here we go. Bring back. So restores means to bring back or to return. Now, it's not that hard to understand. This isn't one of those words that like you find some, ooh, you know, deep, secret, hidden meaning. It's really not any different than what you would find in one of our English dictionaries. In fact, if you were to go to the Oxford English Dictionary and look that same word restores up, you would find this exact same sentiment, to return. So restores in the Oxford English is to repair so as to return it to its original condition. That's the idea here. Now in our house, we have a couple of pieces of furniture that started with my oldest son. What's up, Benjamin? Uh, started with my oldest son and it has now transferred to my youngest son. And these pieces of furniture, there's like a, a bookshelf with some drawers and there's like an armoire piece. And then there's the bunk beds. Here are the bunk beds that now live in Canaan's room. And I, I am a big fan of bunk beds. You'll understand why more in a minute. One thing that I will say about bunk beds is uh, you need to have a keen awareness of where the ceiling fan is. Because let's just say uh, there may or may not be scars all throughout my family that reveal that there was not an awareness of where the ceiling fan was. But in any case, these, th these right here, these are the beds that are in Canaan's room. Like I said, started off with Benjamin. But what's really cool about these beds is we didn't buy these for Benjamin when, when he started on his journey of the big boy bed. Everybody remembers that, right? Uh, these pieces of furniture, when it was time for Benjamin to have his own bed, we actually went and picked these up at my parents' house because this is the furniture my brother and I had growing up which is cool. It's just neat to kind of have that in the family. I hope that one day that we'll pass it on and my grandkids will have this as well. But this is the furniture that my brother and I had grown up. We had all kinds of fun 
on this stuff, had them stacked up. We used to play this game where we would throw like a bean bag down here at the bottom and then we would sit backwards with our backs facing this way and then we would just let ourselves kind of fall backwards till our bottom was sitting. That's why women live longer. Um, with our bottoms sitting against that. And then we would shout this phrase. I have no idea why, but we would say fire pantyhose. And when, <laughs> don't ask me. When we said fire pantyhose, we would just let go and drop on our backs down to the beanbag. Sounds like a good youth game, I'm thinking. Maybe we could try that sometime. Um, I don't know why we did it. I have no idea. But these things, they went through the ringer. We played fire pantyhose on them. Um, we, there was, uh, it went through two boys and a sister who was dragged into some boy stuff a whole lot. And so there was marker on it. There was candle wax on it. Don't ask. Uh, there was crayon. We had taken stickers. Don't you love that when your kids put stickers on furniture? We had put stickers all over. It was, it was a mess. But we went and grabbed this from my parents' house and Michelle and I decided this is what we want Benjamin to have. And then when we found out about Canaan, we were like, this is what we want Canaan to have. And so we put all of this energy and effort. We took sanders, we took stripper and peeled everything off. We sanded it down, down just as far as we could to that, that original beautiful wood, got all the stickers off, all of the gunk, everything that was there. We got rid of all of it. And then we, we refinished everything. And what was so cool is when we got done and we put one of those beds together, I had this moment of uh, flood of memories. <clears throat> I was like, that's it. That's, that's what they look like. That's what I remembered growing up with. And in that moment, what we saw in front of us was not that sticker laden candle covered piece of furniture. What we saw was what the original furniture maker intended for the piece to look like. We got back. It was returned, brought back to us in that moment, restored to its original intended condition. And that is what David is expressing here. That's what David's referring to. The experience that he has in the presence of the Lord is this depth of restoration being brought back. And if you notice, this is what's cool. Look at what David ties <clears throat> this work of restoration to. Look at it. He restores what? My soul. So again, he brings back. He returns my soul. Now don't get stuck there because we may be thinking, wait, how did David lose his soul? How does that even work? You, you have to, again, understand that words can mean different things. And in this case, the, the Hebrew word nefesh, it, it can mean several things depending on the context, depending on the words around it. And so it can mean life. It can mean self. It can mean person. It, you should circle this word right here. It can mean desire. All right. Another word that's not on there that, that we didn't have in the notes. Passion. Right. So as he's writing this, the word that really jumps out, the, nef the definition is emotion or feeling. In fact, if you look at uh, one, of, one of the lexicons that I like, a dictionary that I like, Brown, Driver, and Briggs, they actually say that all of the language indicates that this is what David is referring to. Emotion, feeling, passion. Maybe you've experienced something like this before. Maybe you've experienced one of those moments where it was just a wave of emotion that hits you. I can recall several years ago, we had an experience that we walked through as a family. Um, a story that I was even kind of hesitant to share this morning and Mich Michelle and I kind of prayed over it. And I, I can't share it all yet. I don't think I'm there, but... We, we had this experience as a family where there was an individual who ended up in our lives. And by in our lives, I don't mean we didn't know who this person was. I never had a conversation with them, never spoken to them, never spent any time with them at all. But the way they made their way into our lives is I was part of a pastoral team and part of introducing some uh, ideas and making some really uh, firm stances on what scripture has to say about things. And this person didn't like it, even though they weren't even connected to the church where we were. 
In fact, they were so displeased with it that at that moment, they decided that they were going to do everything they could to drag my name through the mud, started a smear campaign, started saying things about me, about my family, about the church where I served, to the point that it actually ended up with police officers and lawyers in my office. To be clear, this person is someone to this day that my wife and I pray for, that they will experience the presence of Jesus and the transformative power that only he can bring to their lives. But for three and a half, almost four years, our family went through hell. And some of the stuff I can't, I can't even tell you. But there were such lies and statements made that we actually ended up having to go to court so that we could testify about all the things that have been said, all the things that have been done, all the ways our family had been harassed, our church had been harassed, leaders had been harassed. And I can remember the day we showed up at the courthouse and we walked in and I was so blessed to have my wife right there with me and my pastor standing right beside me. Well, uh, just a part of the small handful of people that I would die for in this world. They were right there with me, supporting me. And I can remember we walked into the courtroom. We went through the scanners and we stepped onto the elevator to head to the second floor to go to the courtroom where we were supposed to appear. And as we got on the elevator, we turned around and looked down the hallway and coming up the hallway was a face that I had only seen in pictures. The very person that had spent four years tearing our family apart publicly. Just don't do yourself a favor. Don't Google my name. Okay? You'll find stuff you don't want to find. And that stuff is silly. It's just foolishness. But the stuff that was being said is why we ended up in this courtroom. And I looked and that face that I had only seen in pictures came walking up and then stood on the exact same elevator with us. I didn't feel like praying. In fact, the old Nate, which I confess is very ugly, was ready to roll. I clenched up my fists and balled them as tight as I could in my nice little blazer and my tie. And in that moment, I was ready to throw a fist. Yes, a pastor, a man of the cloth. I was ready to knock somebody out in the name of Jesus. I was so mad. My jaw was clenched. You could hear me gritting my teeth. My knuckles had turned completely white from holding my hands like this. And I kid you not, folks, I was ready to do something that I probably would have regretted the rest of my life. But in that moment... My wife saw, and she reached over, and she took that clenched hand, and she just pried my fingers open and put her hand in mine, and then just brushed my arm like that. She brought me back. And to be very clear, like that, the Lord, through her, brought me back restored my heart, restored my emotions. See, here's the thing. Somebody, let me just throw this out. How many of you this week lost your cool? Anybody? You blew up at your kids? You blew up at your spouse? You blew up at work? Who knows? You lost your cool. You said something that like you just, oh gosh. Maybe you're still there. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe today. The only reason you're at church is because you felt some sense of guilt and you're, you're ready to strangle somebody right now. I can relate. How many of you, how about this? Maybe that's not you. How many of you just felt this deep sense of brokenness and woundedness and hurt this week? How about this one? This next one. How many of you experienced worry? 
Like maybe that crippling, just break you kind of worry where it kept you up at night. It woke you up in the morning. It it was the first thing on your mind was I got to create a pros and cons list about how to handle this situation. Yeah? All of this is what flows out of our brokenness. And what we've been invited to is to know a shepherd who can bring us back, who can restore our hearts, our emotions. And listen, can we just be really honest? If we've ever needed a shepherd, it's now. I was having this conversation just the other night before a meeting that I had here at church with a couple of amazing leaders. And we were talking about how on edge our culture is right now. Like the things that set us off. We've got, we, we now live in a day and age where people are having fights on airlines over not getting enough Sprite. True story. Like we're in a day and age where if you even breathe something that's a political disagreement with me, boom, we're triggered. We go off and we're ready to go to war over it. And listen, as those who are in Christ, he wants better for us. He wants to restore us to our original intended condition. And when I say that, I don't mean the state we were in five or 10 years ago or whenever your political candidate was in office or whenever things felt like that. I'm talking about before it all fell, before sin and brokenness entered the world, we have a shepherd who says, hey, I want to bring that emotional state back to you. So that no matter what's going on around you, you can be confident, assured that he is there with you, shepherding you, restoring your heart, realigning your emotions, your passions, and your desires with him. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths. There it is once again. We don't have to dive deep. It's right there in front of us, right from David himself. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And please catch that right there, how David starts that sentence. He leads me. Right? We saw the same language last week. You remember? So he makes me lie down in green pastures. He There you go, good. There you go. He leads me beside still waters. So uh, on both of those occasions, we see it in some translations. You may have it rendered, he guides me, which is interesting. Because look at this. This is from, I mentioned him last week, Kenneth Bailey. Look what he writes in his book, The Good Shepherd. He says, the good shepherd leads me. He does not drive me. There's a marked difference. Now, he goes on to explain that there are settings with sheep that they, they may be driven. That there may be uh, statements made from behind the sheep to move them forward. But that's very different than the context that David would have shepherded. The, the pastures and the way that he would have handled things. And so Bailey goes on to say just that. In the wilderness of the Holy Land, the shepherd walks slowly, what? Ahead of his sheep. And either, this I thought was so cool, and either plays his own 10 second tune on a pipe or more often sings his own unique call that the sheep know. He leads. This is a practice David would have often been engaged in, guiding, leading the sheep moving out ahead of them to to clear a path, to make a way, to ensure that they had a shepherd they could follow in paths of righteousness, the right paths. And that's exactly what we have to catch. It's an invitation to follow. I know the way, just follow me. And when we consider that, that work of God in our lives, There's such an assurance. We've been blessed to have some friends that have come and visit down here in Southwest Florida. 
uh, a couple of times. And uh, you know you've got good friends when they will come from Western North Carolina to Southwest Florida. Now, I get it. The, the beach is probably part of that. But they come to see us. They come to spend time with us. Jimmy and Tracy have been here a couple of times, uh, as well as uh, Erica and Jeremy. And then this last time, we got to see Rob and Kristen. They came with their whole crew. But it's awesome to have them come down. But that last time since Rob and Kristen came, we did the whole, like we took them to Gilchrist Park and let them see the sunset out there on the water. Don't ever take that for granted. It's beautiful. Got to, got to watch that as the sun just dropped down into the water. Uh, we got to take them to the beach. We actually uh, took them up to Siesta Key when they came that time. And then what was really cool is we booked for them an exclusive by, by relationship only, specialty guided tour of all of the sites of Punta Gorda and Port Charlotte. And so what that looked like was this. My wife drove and I had a walkie talkie. <laughs> and all the way from Siesta Key back down to Punta Gorda, up and through, winding through the historic district, all that, and then back up through Port Charlotte, we, we had our friends there with us. And all along the way, Michelle and I were offering color commentary about all the amazing sights in Port Charlotte. Some of them legitimate, some of them very historical, some of them just me being me. Uh, I said some things. So we traveled around. And what was so great is as we did this, uh, our friends, all they had to worry about was just, was just listening and enjoying what we had to say about all these great sites. And all they had to do was keep their eyes on the Chevy Equinox. That's it. They didn't have to worry about navigating a path. They didn't have to worry about figuring out how to get from Siesta Key down into historic Punta Gorda, driving all through there, and then up into Port Charlotte. They didn't have to worry about any of that. All they had to do was what? Follow. That's it. Because they had this confidence that where they were going, we had already been. And for us here today, God wants us to follow his lead with the confidence that where you are going, he has been. And I hope you catch how we, we worded that there. Because it's a statement not just of him going with us. It's a statement of the fact that, remember this, we've talked about this before. That the very nature of God is he's already there. He's already in the place. So this is what's so glorious about it. Where you are going, he has been, meaning that he's there with you on the journey, but he is also already at the destination at the same time. But what we have to do is remember that it is up to us to follow, to follow in paths of righteousness, the right paths, because it is for our good. Look at that. Look what he says. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Again, some translations say in right paths. Now, why would David say something like that? Well, two reasons. You don't have to write these down, but the first is this. Everything looks the same. Where David had his sheep, everything looked the same. Let me show you a more practical example of it for us. This image we're going to show you is from the neighborhood that we lived in before we moved to Florida a few years back. So this neighborhood right here, there were about 612 houses in this development. They were all, there were like five, maybe six designs. I'm still not sure. I didn't get that confirmed uh, by my uh, Nope, don't know. Five or six designs. They all looked pretty much the same as what I'm getting at, okay? Now, here's what's really funny. In this neighborhood, 612 houses, all of the roads were named something River Road. You know, to make it easy. Not only that, but all of the roads were connected to one another. So what's funny is we would invite people over to our house for dinner. And y'all, 
we don't know where some of them are to this day. <laughs> they're, they're still driving around in there. Now, all kidding aside, there were plenty of times that we would invite people to come over to our house and they'd be 10, 15 minutes late because they took one wrong turn in that neighborhood and they'd have to call and say, okay, we don't know where we are. We, we don't know what's going on. Where, how do we, and we'd have to guide them back and say, okay, if you go this way and then you turn this way. And sometimes we'd just have fun. They'd be like, well, we thought we passed your house. And we'd be like, you did like five times. We just were having fun and let them drive by. But it was easy in this setting. It was so easy for someone to get lost. Now, now imagine for a moment, take that same imagery. Let's amp it up a little bit. You as a sheep in need of a shepherd. And we've seen the picture pictures closer up the past few weeks. Look at this picture a little further out of the Judean wilderness. It all looks the same. If you don't have someone who knows the territory, you get lost. Look at this one right here. This is the one that jumped out at me. If you, I don't know how well y'all can see this, but right up here, these two mountains and ridge lines, they look identical. It's like God was like, ooh, this will be fun during creation. It was like copy, paste, and just dropped one down in. <laughs> and see, see, we need to understand this. Because from the sheep's view, everything looks the same. Which means the sheep will easily find itself lost if it depends on its own ability. How many of you can say there are situations, circumstances in your life that feel very much the same as one you went through before? But what you need to understand is you need to be careful to keep your eyes on the shepherd and not just do what you did last time or you may end up lost. You may end up frustrated because it all looks the same. Not only that, the, the terrain is sketchy. You remember the picture we showed you last week of those oases, the, the, the spots with the water and the green grass that the shepherd would take them to? What you need to catch is this. That required a lot of navigating of some really treacherous terrain, sloped trails, loose soil, rocks. This is, this is one of them. Can you imagine being a sheep trying to figure out how am I going to get to that water and that green grass down there? In those settings... The shepherd knew which trails to take. The shepherd knew the best way for the sheep. But the sheep had to trust the shepherd. He leads me in paths, the right paths. See, the problem only comes when we take our eyes off the shepherd. That's when the panic sets in. That's when the worry sets in is when we begin to think, well, I don't really like this path. Maybe we should go a different way. And the shepherd is going, oh, 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 no, stay with me. Stay with me. Stay close. I'll get you to where we need to be. So these right paths, all of this is a picture of God leading us into his righteousness. It's not just about how you make a decision or a life choice. We're talking about right living in relationship to God. Because here's the thing, I think all of us can, how many of you can say in this room, just by a show of hands, you online, just say, yep. How many of you can say, yeah, I, I do the right thing sometimes, some of the time. Yeah? Again, it always makes me nervous when some of you don't raise your hand on that one. <laughs> then I'm thinking about calling on security real quick because it freaks me out. But all of us can say, yeah, I can, I can kind of do the right thing some of the time. Maybe a few more of you are able to confidently say, yeah, I, I feel like most of the time, 51% of the time, that I do the right thing. But here's what we can say for sure. None of us live rightly all the time because we're incapable of doing so. Oh, well, Nate, I don't know. I don't know that I agree with that. That seems harsh. Cool. Take it up with Paul. None is righteous. No, not one. That's it. He said it, not me. Nobody's righteous because the fact of the matter is for us to strive and try to achieve right living, right relationship with God in and of ourselves, the best result is self-righteousness. 
which is not at all what he wants for us. He wants to lead us and guide us in such a way that with each day we draw closer to him. And in drawing closer to him, we recognize that the right path, the righteous path is to follow him. And here's the great news. You take it a step further in the gospel of John. We're familiar with this passage. John 14, chapter six, Jesus says, he talks about being the truth and the life. We've talked about that before. We often focus on those, but Jesus starts by saying this. He says, I am the way. See, here's what's encouraging. It's not just that he makes a way as our shepherd. He is the way. It's not just that he leads us to righteousness. It's that he reveals that he is our righteousness. Meaning as we misstep, as we try to wander, there's an invitation there as he calls us back to himself. And says, hey, it's okay. I can forgive that. And I can fix that if you're willing to follow me instead of trying to go your own way. He leads me in paths of righteousness. And we'll close with this. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here's the cool part about it all. As my good shepherd, as your good shepherd, He restores my soul. He he sets my heart and my emotions back in place, brings me back. He, He leads me on the right paths. He gives me a place of rest. He provides for me. He causes me to lie down in green pastures and and he leads me beside those still waters. He does all of those things for our good. Yes? Which is great. That's a point of celebration. But ultimately, it's for his glory. See, we can't ever forget that part. Because so many times, we try to make ourselves the main character in the story. And we're not. You see, all of these things, they're great, they're beautiful, they're wonderful. And he does them for our good. But ultimately, it's so that he might receive glory honor and praise is so that as he does them in our lives that we turn right back around and say God you are so good and I thank you I thank you for how you've shown yourself to be faithful and awesome and good in my life it's for his name's sake and even in writing those words David offers us another level of comfort and assurance because He leads us in those paths for his name's sake. But the promise even from that is this. God will never lead us down a path that makes him look bad. He's never going to lead us down a path that makes him look bad. Now, he may lead us down a path that to us feels bad. But we have to keep in mind that he's taking us to a place that only he can fully understand. So he will never take us down a path that costs him his own reputation. That's who he is by his very nature. You think of David as a shepherd. He would never take his flock, his sheep on a path that they could get hurt or broken or fall apart in such a way that there wasn't something good on the other side of it for them. That's the hope that we have as he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, for his glory. He restores my heart. He leads me down the right path. So what do we do this week? You can read. You've got the homework there in front of you, right? I'm going to make you feel kind of awkward. Psalm 23, read it daily, right? How many of you read Psalm 23 every day this week? Man, y'all are the best service all around. Don't tell anybody else, but y'all are doing good. And honestly, that wasn't a great showing. No, how many of you read it at least once? At least once? Twice, three times, that's good, that's good. Because uh, some is better than none, okay? But more is better than some. 
So Psalm 23, read it each day. Take some time. And listen, listen, you're like, oh, Nate, but I've just got so much going on. Y'all, it takes like 27 seconds to read it. Get up 27 seconds earlier. Go to bed 27 seconds later. Uh, finish your bologna sandwich at lunch 27 seconds earlier and read Psalm 23, okay? Work on that memorization, Psalm 23, now one through three, the first three verses. And there's more there. But I want to challenge you just with that one. Maybe in addition to working on memorizing it, maybe this week God would prompt you to actually record that and post it to bless somebody else on your social media page. Because, man, we love clicking like and share with stuff that we just agree with. Hey, can we just consider how impactful it would be for the, through three services and our online campuses? We got like 800 people uh, in a week that, that we interact with. Imagine if 800 people just decided, hey, I'm going to post Psalm 23, 1 through 3 this week instead of a cat video or a political post or some other stupid statement that's poorly informed and probably not true. <laughs> Psalm 23, one through three. Maybe, maybe do that this week. Pray, God, what emotions have gotten out of control in my life? What areas need to be brought back? Worry, restlessness, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. Bring restoration to my heart. What areas of my life am I walking my path instead of the path you're calling me to walk? Jesus, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for these people and the beautiful gift that you've given us to gather together, whether here in this room or perhaps in a living room or kitchen. We just thank you that we get to come together and be reminded of your goodness to us to be challenged to follow you more closely. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, listen, as you go today, I want to remind you on Communion Sunday, uh, that first Sunday of every month, we have these care packages available. And if you recall, or maybe this is new to you, these are designed uh, several of our senior adults here at the church get together and create these. These are to be able to bless people who are maybe a little down on their luck. Uh, maybe life isn't going quite the way they had hoped or expected, but this is an opportunity for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to bless them in a real and tangible way, and at the same time, perhaps even share what Jesus Christ has done in our lives and how they can be changed. Steve was sharing with me this morning that we've given away over 230 of these just in the past couple of months. And we want to keep that going. So grab one of those as you go. Be a blessing to someone this week. Don't forget, we've got a lot going on. Lots of ways that you can connect. Uh, find out more about First Alliance, what, what we're doing, uh, the, the, the change we hope to affect in our community. We've got classes next Sunday and the next that you can find out more about that. We've got our vision meeting coming up in November that we're really excited about. Looking forward to getting together. Our team was together this week. And let me tell you, it got exciting back in one of those connection rooms as we talked about the things God has done this year and look forward to what he's gonna do next year. And, and we're excited about sharing with you. And then baptism's coming up in November as well. We've already got two or three that are signed up for our next baptism. So we would love for you to consider whether you need to take that step in your faith. I love you guys. I'm grateful for every single one of you. And I look forward to when we get to be back together again. Have a blessed week. Follow him close this week. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good one.